Hey everybody, it's Ripley back again. Today we're going to talk about parametric surfaces and surface area. Now, I know a lot of you weren't really stoked on parametric functions back in the day. Remember that? We had like an x of t and a y of t where like if we had a curve, if this was x, y, and we had a curve that didn't behave itself like we wanted it to as far as like a function was concerned, then we could define x and y in terms of t. So like over here, we had a t number line, and the t number line, we pick a value here, and it got mapped to a point over here. So if this was t naught, then this would be x naught comma y naught. Okay, now there's a problem, and the, I think the analogy here that, that's most fitting is the difference between, oh, Wait, let me back up. Hold on. Let me let me not get too crazy. If you recall, we had parametric curves um, earlier in, it was an earlier topic, and we were able to do curves in space using parameters the same way. But if we want to be able to, and, and the best analogy here I think is a 3D printer versus a 2D printer. Excuse me. If I want to be able to print something in 3D, one parameter is not going to suffice. And you can probably figure out why. So instead of grabbing a value from, from T on a real number line, just T, what I have to be able to do if you use that 3D printer analogy is I've got to be able to fix a point on the surface. Let's say fix the point in the X direction. So this is going to be x, and this is going to be y, and this is going to be z. If I can fix a point in the x direction and then allow y to linger, right? or I'm sorry, allow y to roam, then what I can do is I can pick up a nice little cross-section like that. And the way that I fill this, I suppose I should have sort of given that a little more contour, right? Because it's going down, it's following the contour of the surface. And then I pick another one over here, and I do that, right, like that. Likewise, if I want to be able to fix some value on in terms of the, the y, now what I'm saying here is a little bit specious and you'll understand why in just a sec, but I don't want to spend too much time on these because these are pretty fun. Likewise, I should be able to fix a point here and be able to let my values roam in that direction, pick a point here and roam. And then very much like a 3D printer, what we end up with is printing this entire surface, which we're going to call S. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, again, it was a little specious for me to say fix X and fix Y, because that's not really true. What I'm really doing is I'm fixing U and V. U and V are now my parameters, so very much like in one dimension, we have a line. Now we have a Cartesian plane in U and V. So what we do is we're going to fix a U value, and we're going to allow V. I'm going to need to change colors again because this is just so cool. We fix a U value, and we, uh, I don't know what that was, and we allow V to roam. That's not a great color. <laughs> I don't know what just happened there. I'm very sorry. Let's try this again. I need better colors. I need something with some pop. So let's do orange. So we fix U, and then we allow V to roam, or we fix V, and we allow U to roam. And what that does is basically what exactly what I just showed you. Instead of fixing X and Y, we fix a V value, let's say that it cor or a U value, let's say that it corresponds to that point. And then when I allow V to roam, I get something like that. Now maybe I move over and I grab another U value. Let's say that that picks it up right there and I allow V to roam and boom, whoops, and boom, that's what I get. Now if I let it roam across this entire line of U, well, you can imagine what happens. What I'm doing is I'm filling in behaviors like this. And then likewise, if I go the other way, then I fill in this way. And I have the ability to print these really cool print. I'm literally making the analogy with 3D printing because that's the best analogy, I think. I get to stack up a whole bunch of these lines and I end up with surfaces instead. Now, these can be tricky. However, that said, the vast majority of parametric surfaces in 3D are going to be, the vast majority of them are going to be written like this. You're, whoops, let's go back to black. You're going to write them simply as x equals x, y equals y, and z equals f of x, y. Now, what this does is it gives us the equation. As long as z is a function, it gives us 
the equation in parametrics where instead of drawing from u and v, I'm just letting x equal x. I'm letting y equal y. Instead of, I could just as easily let x equal u and y equal v and z equal f of u v. It's just convenient to let them to, to let them uh, behave as themselves, basically. All right. Now, I know that this is a little bit confusing. And like I said, I don't want to get too crazy with this. Um, I'm going to give you a, a, a couple of examples really quickly, just two really quick examples and what they look like. Um, and then we're going to move on with what we can do with them. OK, so maybe this x equals x, y equals y, z equals f of x, y is a little bit confusing, but just bear with me first. OK, now let me let me explain a couple of things and before this gets too confusing. Um, Let's say that I have a function z uh, f of x, y. So let's keep it super simple. I'm going to say that uh, z equals 3x minus 4y plus 2. And hopefully you can see that this is a plane, right? It should be relatively easy to see it's a plane. If I were to throw the z over here, this would equal 0. We could figure out where the x, y, and z intercepts were, and we could build the plane rather nicely. However, if I want to write this as a vector-valued function, very much like what we did with parametric vector-valued functions before around t, if I want to do this, <clears throat> excuse me, if I want to do this using two parameters instead of one and therefore be able to graph an actual solid, then it's really simple. All I would do in this case, because z is a function of x and y, I would simply let x be x, I would let y equal y, and I would let z equal 3x minus 4y plus 2. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, so now remember we've got a vector value function, so I'm going to do this r, and I'm being a little lazy. I should actually put little vector signs over the top of it, but hopefully you're, you'll forgive me, and I haven't done it for much of the year, and I think that you know the difference. Hopefully you know the difference between when I'm talking about vectors and when I'm not. So this becomes r of x, y is equal to, well, it's x, i plus y, j plus 3x minus 4y plus 2k. And what this does is it allows us to parameterize the entire plane. So when I graph this thing, oh goodness, this is going to be a mess. When I, when I bring, the, yeah, I'm going to have a negative x and a, and a positive y and a, what am I going to have? And a negative z. So I'm going to have a point somewhere over here, a point somewhere up here, and a point somewhere down here, and I'm going to have this plane. Ugh, yuck, right? But I'm really going to have the plane. All right, I'm, I apologize, but you guys know where this is headed. What it gives me the ability to do is draw the entire plane instead of just a curve that's moving through space, which I could only do with parameters of one variable under t. All right, so that's easy. That is the vast majority of all the parameterizations that you're going to do. But I do want to do a couple of more, a couple more, just to to sh just show you how this works. So what if I were to let r, I'll throw the vector over, even though I haven't done it. I know I suck. Of uh, uv, and I'm going to let this thing equal. Let's let it be. I don't know. Let's let it be uh, cos theta i plus. Uh, let's go sine theta j plus, I don't know, oh, uv. No, I should probably let this be u theta, shouldn't I, since I've got thetas as, as variables. Let's I'm just pick them. Now my, now my parameters are u and theta. And let's go u, uh, k. All right? Now, what would this thing look like? Well, what are my parameters? First and foremost, x of uh, uv, x of u theta, sorry, guys, is equal to cos theta, y of u theta is equal to sine theta and v or excuse me z is equal to u Ugh. z of u theta is equal to u right that's all i'm doing is i'm stuffing that into here into th now we got this three space vector right and what's this thing going to carve out well, think about think about it in these terms if i were to fix u and let theta roam what would I get? Well, hopefully by now, remember this is the this is the i unit vector. That's the j unit vector, and or the unit vector in the i direction or along the x-axis. 
uh, this is the unit vector along the y axis, excuse me, and likewise that's the unit vector along the z axis. Well, what am I going to get? Let's let's assume that, let's just put some limits on our parameters first. I'm going to say that theta is between 0 and 2 pi, and I'm going to say that u is greater than or equal to 0. Well, if I fix u, if I just say, okay, let u be any value, what will I get? Well, hopefully by now, change my colors real quick, hopefully by now you realize that what you're going to get is a circle. Now, if u is 0, then I, that means that I have no values in the vertical direction. In other words, up z. So what I end up with is this circle, right? So as I let theta roam, I'm going to end up with that circle in the xy plane because what z is 0, right? I let u equal 0. Now, as I let u grow, well, what happens? Well, predictably, what we end up with is, whoops, dang, I cannot draw a straight line today. What we end up with is a cylinder. So this is another way to describe a cylinder parametrically, right? And this would theoretically, since I said u is greater than or equal to zero, this would take off and go up to infinity, okay? Now, remember though, what's happening very much like a 3D printer is, I'm plugging in values of theta and u simultaneously, theoretically. And like a 3D printer, this thing's going zzz, and it's car carving out that first circle, and it's carving out the second circle, and it's carving out the third circle, and it's carving out that, right? And, but there's an infinite, uh, 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 let's see, an infinite number of infinitely thin circles, which kind of should lead you in sort of a, a thought direction that's like, okay, I, I'm starting to figure out kind of what we're going to do with these. Now, I do want to sh show you one re really cool uh, curve that you can um, do. It's called a helisoid. Uh, is that right? I always screw that up. It is called, it is called a helisoid. Look at that. Okay, so first and foremost, look at this bad boy. It's just, I, how do you how do you make that, right? As you can tell, it's, you know what it looks like is it looks like one of those ramps at a stadium. <clears throat> In fact, you wonder if they use that to model. Now you may say, Ripley, how would I ever be able to graph something like that? Well, look over here. This is the parametric equation of that helisoid. Okay. Now, I want to be clear on something because this is actually interesting. Now, they use different parameters than I used. I, what did I use? I used u's and thetas. They're using rho and, and um, theta. Th this alpha is a constant. Okay. So what I want to do is I, I want to show you what happens here. <clears throat> what, what, what are we doing here? I get, no, I guess in this case, they're just they're fixing rho and alpha. So what do each one of these grid lines represent? Well, theoretically, what they're representing is what would happen if you fix, let's say that rho was actually allowed to roam, okay? So if we fix theta and we let rho roam, then these lines, these contour lines, would represent rho being allowed to roam through values. Fix theta, allow, allow rho to basically carve out. Now, if I fix rho and I let theta roam, well, then what do I get? Well, I get these guys, right? Basically, what's happening? I let theta roam, so we're going up the z as I fix rho at any one of these values. So this would be rho equals, I can't even tell based on the scale. This would be like rho equals 0.5. Fix it, let theta roam, boom, off we go. Okay, let rho be uh, three quarters. Okay, fix it, let theta roam, boom, that's what we get. So that's what those contour lines are. They correspond <clears throat> to what parts of the curve would look like either if you fixed, in this case, rho or theta. All right, I hope that gives you a little bit of insight. I know that that can be confusing, and I'm not going to lie to you. This is not my strong suit, is being able, you, know, you guys know how terrible of an artist I am and when I have to think about things in 3D with two parameters, not just one friendly parameter like we had, but now we've got U's and V's. I run into a bit of trouble as well. I hope this was a little bit helpful. Now we get to actually play with this, these things and figure out how to take the surface area. How am I going to figure out the surface area of, <clears throat> of something like this. Now, you may say, wait, Ripley, we've done surface areas of 3D surfaces before. Yeah, but that's only when they were functions. When they look like this, that's not a function of Z. It doesn't pass the vertical Z test, does it? So when they look like this, how am I going to be able to figure out the surface area of this? Because I don't get to use my fancy little formula, even though, as you're about to find out, the fancy little formula looks 
suspiciously similar to what we've seen in the past. All right, I'll see you back here in just a Okay, now we're gonna do two things in this next little piece. We're gonna figure out how to find a tangent plane to a surface in space. Now you may say, whoa, 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 Ripley, we already have a formula for tangent planes. We did this. Yeah, but that's only true if we had a function, if this guy could be defined as f of x, y. Right? Remember we took the partials and we did all that fun stuff? Well, if you use that information, if you use that thought process, it's really, really useful to be able to extend that into surfaces that aren't necessarily functions of x and y, like that crazy hilosoid that I just showed you. Okay. However, the idea is exactly the same. Now, remember, this surface we are defining as sum r of u v. It is a parametrized surface of two variables. Right? So if I have, if I have R of U V is just equal to X of U V I plus Y of U V J plus Z of U V K. That's just this guy. What I need to do is be able to figure out how to make a tangent plane first. And you're probably going, Ripley, I know where this is going because once I can come up with a big tangent plane, so let's give it an ugly color, like I've got some tan ugly tangent plane that's coming through here and touching on this point, right? And that would be tangent to that curve. Once I can figure out how to come up with that, then I can shrink that down, add a whole bunch up, and guess what I have? I have surface area, which is incredibly useful. All right, to be able to figure out the area of something for obvious reasons, at which we've already seen. <clears throat> okay, excuse me. Now, how do we do this? Well, it's actually quite simple. What I need is I need two vectors that I can cross with one another, right? I need a vector like this guy, and I need a vector like this guy, and I can cross them into one another, right? Well, as you probably are already realizing, the beauty of this parameterization in terms of U and V, remember what we did? We allowed... We fixed u, and then we allowed v to roam. Now, what does that do? Well, it, this is a vector-valued function. It creates, let's say that, that whoop, this point right here corresponds to some point u, comma, v equal to 0, right? It's fixed. I'm just saying that that corresponds. I, I'm not trying to name this surface at all. As I let v roam, what do I get? Well, I get a vector, let's say, that goes in that direction. Now, likewise, if I, let, if I fix V and I let U roam, well, let's say that this again, I don't know, we've got some other vector that's floating somewhere on this surface, not on the plane. But these vectors are on the surface, by the way. Bam. And let's say it moves that, and I can move vectors around. Remember that? You may be like, Ripley, you're in the wrong spot. Well, I moved it. <laughs> don't be afraid. I can cross those vectors into one another. And when I cross those vectors... And I know I'm, I'm hedging a little bit in terms of what I'm talking about in terms of vectors, but let's, or in terms of um, maybe deep theory, but you're going to have to give me a little bit of leeway. We know that when I cross them, I get a normal vector. That normal vector is what we use to define the plane. Now, how do we do that? How do we come up with this idea? All right, how, as, what, what, like, how do I create these vectors? Well, you're probably figuring it out by now. It's called the partial. All I do is I take the partial of R with respect to U, right? That's all I do. That's what partials are. Remember how they work? We fix one value and we allow the derivatives to roam across the other. That's all we're doing. So I take the R, I take the partial of R with respect to U, which is just D over D, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, u, and what are we taking the partial of? Well, we're taking the partial of x. Uh, u, v, I remember partials of vectors produce vectors, so this is going to be the partial of u, whoops, the partial with respect to u of y, of u, v, j, plus the partial with respect to u of z, of u, v, and this is k. Likewise, we take r of v. All right, r sub v, which is just the partial with respect to v. So again, I'm sorry to bore you, but this is going to be x of u v i plus the partial with respect to v of y of u v j plus the partial 
with respect to z of u v k. And then what do I do with those? Well, it should be relatively easy to figure out, right? Now we got to be careful here. I want you to think about this. <clears throat> what I got to, yeah, and, and this requires for me, like my head goes into a space where I'm like, whoa, what am I doing? Well, what we have to do is we got to make sure that the normal curve pokes out in a way that's useful. Now, in the next piece of content, where we start talking about surface integrals, we talk about something called orientation. And the behavior of this, of uh, well, not of this surface. This surface is what this surface is. But the behavior of some of the things that we're going to do with this surface changes if our orientation changes as well. In other words, if I cross, I'm, I'm, this is way too small a space. Let's draw those vectors writ large. Okay, so let this this is going to be vector one. Let's say that this is the vector produced by this is R U, and this is R V. Okay, and I cross R U into R V. What's going to happen? Well, what we're going to get is we're going to get we're going to get a tan or a, a unit vector. Or try again, a normal vector that is popping vertically out, isn't it? Right, or it's pop. I guess it's not popping vertically necessarily, depending on the, cur the the shape of the surface. But it's it's going up z. Now, if I do r v into r u, then it's going to go down z. Now, think about orientation from line integrals. Right? Think about orientation from closed line integrals. Right? Remember those? Remember what we talked about? What do you think? Intuitively speaking, what do you think we're going to want to do? Are we going to want to cross the partial of r with respect to v into u or the other way around? Well, how did we traipse in line intervals when I had my curves? What was optimal? What was the best way? What was the best way to go around the curve? Well, counterclockwise. So that should tell you, that should give you some insight that we're going to cross R u into R v. We want those normal vectors to pop up, right? We want them to pop up on this type of a surface. We want them to go up the z. Now, that's going to get a little crazy down the road, but bear with me for now. So an easy way to define the tangent plane, remember any tangent plane or any plane can be is defined by the normal vector that behaves like a handle, right, on the plane. So all that I do is take RU and cross it with RV. That's all I do. That's, that's all I do. Now, I am not, this produces, if I cross these guys, what this produces is a normal vector. Yeah, sorry, normal vector. And once I have the normal vector, I can get to the plane easy, easily, remember? Because a plane is, it, it, let's see, plane. Remember, a plane is just defined as A times X minus X naught, where X naught is the X coordinate of a point, plus B times Y minus Y naught, whoops, Y naught, plus C times Z minus Z naught, equals zero where the vector a, b, c is normal. Now, I'm not going to force you to watch me write like what this turns into when I cross our, uh, the, nor the, excuse me, the partial with respect to u of r with the partial with respect to v. If you'd like to see that done more rigorously, please feel free to check it out in your book. But that's how you produce the normal vector. Now, once you have the normal vector, you can get to the plane, and the plane is very simple. Okay, in the next section, I'm going to take a little break because i got to drink some water and some tea. Um, in the next section, we're going to talk about how to go from the plane to surface area, okay? The surface area of this, um, of this surface, <laughs> which is kind of funny. All right, I'll see you in a second. Okay, everybody, so what I did is I sort of cooking showed a little surface here, and then we've got our parameters u and v, and we know that the parameters map onto the surface. And what we're going to try and figure out is how to do, how to find the surface area of this S curve, or this S surface, all right? Now, I wanted to make it a little bigger so we weren't sort of up in our grill as far as uh, trying to figure out what we were looking at over there. So let's, let's think about this. How does this really work? Remember, when we, when we build these R's from U to V, what are we making? Well, we're making vectors. They're vector-valued functions. So 
what we've got here is if I've got myself, let's change colors real quick. If I've got myself a little change in U, that delta U, what does that translate into? Well, it translates into a little vector change over here. Likewise, if I've got a little change in V, what does that translate into? Well, it translates into a vector change on my surface, right? Does that make sense? So now I've got two vectors to play with. Okay, now this is a tricky part. The thing that we have to realize, that we really have to understand here, is that this square that I built here in the UV plane does not necessarily and shouldn't translate into a square on my surface. That wouldn't make any sense, would it? However, it is a parallelogram. And if we think of this as a parallelogram like this, right? Do you remember how to find the area of a parallelogram given two vectors? Well, <laughs> kind of like this, right? Except the difference is if this guy, how am I going to draw this? If this guy right here is going to be produced by R U of U V. And I'm going to shorthand that as just R U. And this is going to be created by our R V of U V, right? In other words, these are partials. I took the partial with, because I fixed v and went along u, so that's how we define a partial of r with respect to u, likewise with the partial with respect to v, okay? So how am I going to come up with the area of this parallelogram? Well, hopefully you remember from way back in the day, all that I have to do is take the magnitude of r u crossed with r v. If you don't remember that, then Go back and look, where was it? It was like 12.5 when we first started talking about cross products. And it had to do with the area. Remember, one half AB sine theta. And, and then we double that and we get the triangles, blah, 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 blah. Okay. So if you think about how, the, how I can figure out the overall surface area of this, well, it's super simple. Ooh, I'm going to run out of room. Um, well, I'll put the equals on the other side. All I'm going to do is I'm going to take the double sum of the magnitude of these cross products, and I'm flying super loose and easy with these. Remember how we would go I, one to N, J, one to N, right? And then this is gonna be some some asterisk, some, these are where I just grab these points, right? Oh, I, I reckon I should have said that, that this U, I, V, J translates into this point right here. Well, forgive me. And then I've got my delta U, delta V. Well, hey, guess what we have? we have a good old-fashioned formula. Now, this is actually a definition for how to find the area of a surface. And I'm going to write it out just as it is in the book, more or less. All right? So if I've got a smooth parametric surface that is created by a vector value parameterized function, R of uv, where you've got x of uv i plus y of uv j and these are functions and i know i, I know you guys hate me with these because i don't have a bold ability with remember these are vectors this guy is a vector so i could do this and i could do that and i could do that if i wanted to but i think you know me well enough and you know the material well enough that that shouldn't screw you up too much if it does then maybe i'll i'll uh i don't know i don't know what i'll do um we've got uv sorry i've had a lot of tea today um, uv come out of our domain, right? This is just in some domain d. Then I know that the area of the surface, well, what am I doing? I'm adding up an infinite number of infinitely thin, thin in both this direction and this direction. I'm just shrinking this parallelogram down to a teeny tiny size. And I'm doing it kind of like, uh, like think about it, I'm going this way and this way at the same time. I'm just make or at the same time in the UV plane, and that translates into a shrinking of this little mini parallelogram. I add all those guys up. And guess what? I've got the surface area. Now the way that we write this is the double integral over d of r of u crossed with r v. Now you got to be careful with this thing. We're taking the magnitude, which is nice, because if I take the magnitude of the cross, I'm going to ask you sort of a rhetorical question and let you think about it for a little bit. If I cross r v with r u and I take the magnitude, does it make any difference? No, but the direction 
in which this the the normal vector comes squirting out of these two ver uh, vectors is going to be different, isn't it? And that becomes really really important when we start talking about something called surface integrals. In this case, if I cross R u into R v, what I'm getting is I'm going in this direction. So by the right hand rule, I'm going to get a nice normal vector that pops vertically out of. Well, again, watch my I'm flying loose with that one as well. That pops uh, normal to these curves, but up out of the of the surface. And that gets, like I said, that's really important. Now, let, let's define RU. RU is just the partial with respect to U of this guy. Excuse me. So it's, excuse me, partial X with respect to U of, let's see, I plus partial Y with respect to U, J plus partial Z with respect to U, K, and then RV, R sub V, it's just the partial x with respect to vi plus the partial y with respect to vj plus the partial z with respect to vk. Okay? That's pretty Now the coolest thing about that is this works for all surfaces as long as all of the partials exist as long as it's a piecewise smooth surface. It doesn't matter if it's a function of x and y. It can be one of those awful helisoids like I showed you earlier, right? It doesn't that it doesn't matter. Now, what I, I want to revisit something here, and you may be like, Ripley, why are you going back over this? Well, watch, because this is actually really cool. What if I want to find the whoa, I don't know what happened there. Let's try, oops, I must have hit something. Doink. What happens? If I want the surface of z equals f of x, y. Okay, now I'm actually going to go through it and I'm going to use this formula right here, but I'm going to build it out. All right, so if it's a surface of, uh, uh, or excuse me, if, z, if the surface is defined at, by z equals f of x, y, in other words, it, the, the um, curve doesn't wrap back on itself like a helisoid or anything like that, then the parameters are super easy. I simply go, wow, I did that again. Why is it doing that? Let's try this again. Then the parameters are easy. It's just x equals x, y equals y, and z equals f of x, y. So I know that r is r of x y is uh, uh, what is that x i plus y j plus f of x y k. All right, this is the thing that gets us where we need to be. So I know that the partial. All right, I think I got it squared away. When in doubt, hard reset. So I know, I know the partial is going to be i. All right, if I take the partial with respect to x, this thing disappears, and I get the partial of f with respect to x, k. The partial of r with respect to y is going to equal, uh, let's see, the first term's going to go away, right, because it doesn't have a y, and this is going to be j plus the partial with respect to f, or excuse me, the partial of f with respect to x of k. Now, I'm going to go through the process, and the reason why is we're going to get some really important information out of here that's going to sort of look... Um, familiar to you, but we'll, we'll play with that in a sec. So if I cross these two, it's good practice to see this thing get crossed because uh, cross ADD and crossing, not a good combination. So it's not a bad idea. Let's see, what do I got? I, I'm going to have a 1, I'm going to have a 0, and I'm going to have a partial of F with respect to X, and then I'm going to have a 0 and a 1 and a partial of at, oop, that should be a y, and hopefully you guys are not going to yell at me too soon on that. The partial of f with respect to y. And let's see what we get. So i, I'm going to get a 0. I'm going to get a negative partial of f with respect to x, i. With i, I'm going to get, uh, what the heck am I going to get? Or excuse me, with j. So this is going to be a partial with respect to y minus 0. But I have to turn that into a minus, don't I? Okay, ooh, that was good, that was good. I turned it over and then it flipped back, that's good. So this is going to be minus the partial with respect to f, oh, let's see, partial of f with respect to y, j, and then k is just going to be what? Plus one, plus k, right? Does that make sense? Now, if I take the magnitude of this, what do I get? I get the partial, the magnitude of the partial with respect to x crossed with y, and this turns into the partial of f with respect to x squared plus the partial of f with respect to y 
squared plus 1, the square root of that. So I know that the surface area of the entire function, now remember this is a function of x, y, is going to be the double integral over the domain of the square root of 1 plus the partial of f with respect to x. Hey, we've seen this before. Partial of f with respect to y squared and dA. Now, isn't that delightful? Now, the thing that I want to make sure that you understand, and I'm going to put this thing in bold red so that it ends up in your notes, this is really, really helpful. If I have a function of x, y, if I parameterize said function in such a way, when I cross them, I can use this. And that should look kind of interesting for you, okay? That, that we're going to use this a lot because I don't want to have to go through this process every single time, okay? All right, I think that about sums it up. Um, I think, uh, I, I think we're done. <laughs> um, I, I hope you enjoyed it. This is this has been a long one. I apologize for the length, but it's it's definitely been fun. So I'll see you guys in class tomorrow, and we're gonna do just a ton of these. If you're panicking about parameterizations about functions using two variables, don't. We're gonna go through a bunch of them together. There's gonna be a lot of homework, but it'll it will definitely be done together. All right, see you soon. Have a good day. Bye bye.